Uh, okay, so <laughs> Tomer is uh, obviously, like everyone else, a very good friend and the Azure, at Microsoft Azure Research Program Manager. Gil Dabach is the CEO of Northbeat and they're going to be showing us today an interesting demo of a live kernel exploitation. Gil and Tomer. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to have a fantastic talk today. Uh, I think you, we all remember this old arcade game called Ellicat. We all used to play it when we were young in Israel. Raise your hand if you play that game. Ah, uh, that's good. So today we're going to meet Ellicat's evil brother, the kernel cat, which likes to do some other things, like lateral movement between garbage can and wires in order to reach his love. But before we start talking about everything, I would like to introduce Gil Dabach. Hello everyone, my name is Gil Dabach. I'm the CEO of Northbit, where we do security research. It's not cyber research in bar, it's security research, so I don't have to drink. Um, we do, it, at Northbit, we are uh, security researchers doing a consultancy for uh, other customers, working on the core IP of their technology. Uh, in the past, I've been myself a researcher and I published a few um, stuff and uh, one of them, one interesting uh, story I could tell you is that uh, back in 2007 I wrote a patch myself for Internet Explorer that uh, had a vulnerability in ex being exploited in the wild and I did it faster than Microsoft. So uh, don't tell Tom, Tom here. Um, also I'm the author of this Tom and I published uh, some zero day responsibly uh, after the ethical talk here. And uh, Tom, back to you, please introduce. So hi, I'm Tom Teller. I work for uh, Microsoft and Azure uh, Cyber Security Group. Uh, previously, I worked for Checkpoint for 10 years. I managed the Security Research Innovation Group, uh, where we uh, created a lot of proof of concept, patents, uh, white papers, and presented them in leading conferences around the world. But you know, don't mind us. The real guest today is the Kernel Cat. I would like to introduce him. He's born in 1984. He's Ellie Cat's evil brother, and he loves to hack computers, like all of us, right? And what does he do all day once he hacked the computer? He likes to move laterally and use his favorite tool, Mimikatz, of course. Now, Mimikatz, for those of you who don't know, is a Windows post-exploitation tool. Usually, attackers bring it after they compromise the machine, whether it's on disk or in memory, using Metaplet or Metasploit or something uh, housemade. Once they get that tool or a set of tools into the compromised machine, they will lightly extract some sensitive information from the computer, such as clear text password, pre to Windows 8, and of course, password hashes, Kerberos tickets, and use it to move laterally in the network using pass the hash or pass the ticket technique. Now, where do they get those hash? When attackers manage to compromise the machine, how do they manage to grab the hash and move laterally inside the organization? In order to understand where the hash are stored, we need to understand a little bit about the ELSAS process. ELSAS, Local Security Authority Subsystem Process, is responsible for the overall security policy in the system and whenever a user logs in. It also manages the SEM file, the SEM file that uh, contains all the local users. But most importantly, is there to support the Windows single sign-on. You know, when you type in your password once and then you're free to log into any resource in the network as long as you want, as much as you can without typing your password again? Well, there's no magic or voodoo behind it. Elsas has to store the hashes, the credentials, encrypted in memory in order to present it to the resource in order to prevent from you to type in the password each time. Now let's start our story for today. Once upon a time, Kernel Cat managed to compromise a computer network like he always do, and his tack was always to reach his lady love over here, circle in red. It's pretty, right? Now, one day he tried to uh, move laterally inside the network, but he failed to do that. The reason behind that is that Mimikat failed. Mimikat failed to extract the hash from the ELSAS process. Now, the reason behind that is because the computer he compromised was a hardened Windows 8.1 computer that was running new technology from Microsoft, such as pot, uh, protected process light. This is a technology that doesn't allow even a system administrator with the highest privilege of system to access critical processes. Now, Microsoft added it because obviously the least privilege model failed. People abuse it too often. Everyone runs an admin because they don't want to run as administrator all the time. 
And because of that, they said, okay, we need a more granular protection level for each process. And they marked some critical process, so even you're an administrator on your own machine, you won't be able to access it. On top of that, they removed all the plain, uh, plain text password from memory, but the hashes are still there. You know, the hashes in order to support the single sign-on. But tell me, Tomer, why we care so much about the hashes? I mean, the plain text passwords are gone, and what are we going to do now? How can we move laterally in the network? It's a good question. Actually, behind the scene, in order to um, move laterally inside the network, you don't actually need the clear text password. You only need the hash because uh, protocols such as Kerberos and NTLM leverage those hashes in order to uh, communicate in the network. Now, kernel cat has to gain those hashes from memory, and these, uh, uh, these hashes are potentially stored in Elsa's memory. Now, the problem is that we cannot access it from user mode anymore because of the protected process light. Gil, do you mind showing a quick demo of what happens uh, in a computer with a protected process? Sure. So, okay, so what I'm showing you now is the task manager. Uh, that's nothing interesting by itself. It's a built-in program inside Windows. And I'm selecting the ELSOS process. Uh, this is where all the, eventually all the keys are stored. So I will try to take a dump, a memory dump of this process, and you are going to see that I'm getting access denied since this process is protected, okay? Um, now I will show you next that Mimikatz fails to do the same thing. So the first thing to do, we'll try to add the debug privilege into our process, and that's all right. Uh, the debug privilege basically gives us the ability to debug and to attach to other processes in the system in order to be able to uh, access their memory. And now I will try to do a dump of the passwords, and as you can see, it fails as well. Okay, that's great. So it means that if you're an attacker and you're coming to a hardened Windows 8.1 with all your tools, you won't be able to do that. Well, that's a problem. And Kernel Cuts really need to get to his lab. And for that, he defines some strict objectives in order to get in. So let's define those objectives and get those hashes to help Kernel Cut meet his lady love. The first objective, obviously, we need to infiltrate inside the kernel. We can't get those hashes from the user mode. Let's get it from the back door. Once we're inside the kernel, we move laterally inside the process memory, the kernel memory, looking for the ELSAS process and attach to it. Once we're inside the ELSAS process, what we're going to do is we're going to run linearly, looking for specific signature, extract the hashes, the keys, decrypt them, and game over. Our goal is to meet Lady Cat. So are you ready to start the game? Sure. Let's start. So our first, um, our first task objective is to get inside the kernel, and it's not as easy as you may think. Attackers are having a lot of headaches this year because Microsoft is investing a lot of substantial resources in order to secure the kernel. For example, data structure hardening is something that Microsoft added in the last couple of uh, releases and patches. What it basically does is they listen to the attacker community. Whenever attackers use uh, specific objects in memory in order to exploit something, they change those objects to make it even harder to exploit. You also have ASLR, address space layout randomization, which means that every time the system boots or a process loads, at least in user mode, all these models are randomized in memory, which means that an attacker doesn't know where are the addresses located, so when he's trying to do his return-oriented program uh, uh, jumps, he won't be able to write fixed addresses. Microsoft ported the same technology into kernel space, making it even harder to understand addresses and, and models inside the kernel. Same goes to DEP, data execution prevention. User give us some data, we can't, ex we can't trust it, we can't place it in an executable place because obviously you will pass a shell code, we'll jump to that shell code, game over. So they introduced DEP and the same technology imported to the kernel. And last but not least, we have the SMAP. SMAP is a new technology enforced by the CPU. Gil, do you mind explaining about it? Sure, so let me explain about uh, SMAP. So in order to exploit kernel vulnerabilities, what, what the hackers have to do is basically allocating their uh, shellcode in user mode and eventually run it from uh, doing something inside the kernel that's exploiting the vulnerability in kernel and transferring, transferring the control from kernel mode into the shellcode which was allocated in user mode, okay? And this is because usually when we hack into systems, we come from uh, user mode process, whether it's a browser or something like that. So uh, privilege of escalation is, um, is mitigated in, in the way 
because the processor can uh, detect this uh, kernel mode to user, to user space uh, mix, okay? So I will now explain to you how, how actually it's done inside, uh, inside the processor. So in, in modern uh, operating systems, such as Windows, uh, we use uh, virtual memory, obviously. And virtual memory is technically done by page tables. But we are not going to talk about it because it's going to take a whole hour. But I would like to uh, concentrate on the PTEs. Uh, each and every uh, virtual page is described by a PTE. A PTE is a page table entry. A PTE contains or describes the virtual page uh, characteristics like whether it's writable, whether it's readable, uh, what's the physical um, page that it actually maps to. And uh, one special bit is the owner bit, okay? The owner bit actually indicates whether the, the page is in the user space or the kernel space. So all that the CPU has to do is to compare between the CPL and the owner bit. The CPL is the current privilege level. It means the processor is running inside ring zero, so CPL is zero. And then if there is a mix between the owner bit and the CPL, we know it's um, like something that we don't want to run, right? So the exploitation is busted. And there is a trap back to the operating system. So in Windows, starting with uh, Windows 8, uh, this feature is enabled once uh, Windows boots. And it's simply setting the 20 bits in control register 4, as you can see here in the picture. And uh, there are also in control register 4, there are also other capabilities, but uh, we don't care much about them. So now we are going to present a few techniques that uh, the security community presented in the last uh, year or two. So the first technique is about doing a kernel rope to jump into some code snippet inside the kernel which will disable this exactly bit. And once this bit is disabled uh, in the CR4 register, then the processor will stop doing uh, this detection. So the problem with this, uh, with this technique is that it's very nice like in theory and in the lab. But in reality, real hackers can't use it because in different windows and after different uh, windows uh, patches and updates, the offsets inside the kernel they change all the time. Uh, another technique that used to work until Windows uh, 8.1 was to maliciously craft a special object in the kernel to have the shell code. And since it used to be inside an executable pool, that code um, wouldn't be stopped by SMAP because it's uh, inside kernel already. So Makes SMAP sense. doesn't detect it. And the last technique here is uh, OK, so we said that the, the hackers allocate the shellcode inside user mode, OK? Now we know how the SMAP is enforced by the processor. So what happens next is that um, we, change the, we change the owner bit of the PTE that uh, has the shellcode inside user space to become like it's inside kernel space. And then SMAP is again um, mitigated. Yeah, um, just circumvent. So, now, I'm going to present a new technique that uh, we researched uh, in Novbit. And this technique is supposed to be much easier, uh, much more robust, which is important if we want to use uh, exploitation in real life, uh, um, you know, like pen testing and stuff like that. So imagine that we managed to find a kernel object that, in a way, we have the ability to influence it to have some user-defined data, uh, in our case, the shellcode, okay? So what we do is we, um, we take some, okay, so we, have the, we manage to copy it into, into the kernel, and kernel can't. I think, I think that the example is self-examinatory. Yeah, I, 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 I will talk about the example, then <laughs> it will uh, make more it. sense. So it's something that uh, you think shouldn't be shouldn't be possible, right? Because you say, how can you copy your shellcode into the kernel? Like the operating system shouldn't allow you to do it, right? So what actually happens is that we have, like this example, we have a simple API, insert menu item, and you can see the string literal uh, with user-defined code. Imagine that it might, uh, might contain the shellcode. By calling this API, which is totally documented, is um, what happens under the hoods that it goes to a syscall, 
And this syscall actually copies the data from user space to kernel space. And once it's already in kernel space, the owner bit of the page that describes this uh, virtual memory is already marked as kernel, so SMAP is bypassed. But however, there is still a problem we have to, uh, to bypass, okay? Now DEP is back into the business because starting with Windows 8.1, the, the kernel was hardened again to, to separate pools of memory, okay? So if kernel drivers used to just allocate any object they want in kernel, uh, they have to do it again, but in a specific pool. So there are executable pools and non-executable pools. Obviously, a simple uh, kernel object doesn't need uh, to be executable, right? So let, let, me, let me get it straight. So uh, you create an object in user mode, you manage to copy something, and then using a syscall, transfer that user mode code into kernel mode. That means that you evaded SMAP because now it is sitting on an object that is marked as a kernel. Right. But now this object sits in a non-executable pool. So we have a different problem right now, which is DEP. Now, what attackers are actually doing, and we've seen that from researchers on the internet as well, what they're doing literally is taking the, the PTE, the page table entry, that the shellcode is located in. The PTE is described like this. It's a set of bits that controls the, uh, the location, the PTE itself, the table, the virtual table that describes that table. And one of the bits in the end, as you can see, bit number 63 is called NX, no execute, which means that everything that is inside that code, everything mapped inside that PTE is not executable. Obviously, DEP enforced. What attackers are doing, they're locating that PTE in memory and they're patching that single bit. When you're si when as, as soon as you do that, as soon as you patch that bit, that's it. DEP is disabled and you can execute. This means that this object automatically becomes in a RWX pool. Now, one of the biggest problem right now because of KSLR and other mitigations in the kernel is for attackers to locate that PTE in the memory, which is not that trivial. However, researchers have, have shown that there are some fixed location in memory, what we like to call anchors or base addresses, which are fixed in memory across all versions of Microsoft and Windows, which means that doesn't matter if ASLR is enforced, they still, attackers still manage to get to them, anchor, and jump to the place they want, circumventing KSLR. Now, all they need to do is form that simple formula right here, which is the base, which is on a fixed address, and some, uh, some other objects in order to find that PTE in memory. But how do we know the kernel object virtual address? It's inside the kernel space, so obviously the operating system is going to hide it for, for us. Uh, that's exactly true. We have a missing link here in the formula. We don't know where the object is sitting in memory, where it's located in memory. We need to find it. And in order to do that, you need a vulnerability. And Gil is going to talk to you about the vulnerability they discovered and researched in Northbit and uh, fully disclosed with Microsoft and how we did it. Okay, so we are now going to concentrate about the Win32 kernel module. This module is responsible for all the graphical user interface uh, you see in Windows. Every time you use the desktop or no matter what, you're using the Windows operating system, all the graphics you see is being done in the kernel by this module, okay? Now, because it's in the kernel, so what happens every time that a user space uh, process wants to do like graphics and stuff like that, it has uh, to switch from user mode to kernel mode, okay? This switch, uh, it's called the, um, like, context. Yeah, not exactly. I mean, going from user mode to, to kernel mode. So this switch takes time for the processor, okay? And in order to make it faster, what the designers of the operating system did was to map some of the kernel mode uh, objects into user mode, okay? Now, one of the problems, so we, we gained performance, but the other problem is that now some pointers that point to kernel addresses are revealed to the user mode process where the attacker works from. So right now I'm going to describe a use after free uh, of a menu state object inside the Windows kernel, which is already patched. Um, so imagine there is a thread A, okay? Thread A wants to show to the user a simple menu, okay? And behind the hoods, there is a, under the, the hoods, whatever, there is a, a menu state object that is being created just to denote the state of this menu, okay? This is, so far, everything is normal. This is how the kernel works. But now imagine there is suddenly thread B. And thread B somehow references the same menu state object 
of uh, thread A, because we said thread A is the owner of this menu state object. Okay, now what would happen if thread B actually kills thread A? Let's see. So, okay, so thread A is, so thread A is now uh, terminated, and in turn it has to kill all its objects that uh, it owns. So it kills the menu state object as well. And now what happens next is the situation that the thread B still points to unallocated or just garbage memory. And this is where kernel cat comes into the game in order to exploit it. Okay, so uh, we heard about uh, that one day vulnerability and the way it bypasses KSLR and our attackers are doing it and KDP and SMAP. But I think that the crowd wants to see it in action. Do you mind showing us a quick demo of how it works? Now, what we're going to see right now, when attackers, usually when you're writing uh, a vulnerability, when uh, people also report vulnerability to Microsoft, what they do is they bring a proof of concept. What better proof of concept is to show a blue screen showing that there is a kernel crash going on. So what we're going to see here, don't be alarmed, this is not a bug uh, from the vulnerability point of sight. This is just a normal crash showing that the vulnerability really exists. Again, this was patched a few months ago, fully disclosed. So we did it on purpose to show you that uh, if, if you were quick enough to see that the Win32K model was uh, actually the cause of the problem, that it's actually a bug, okay? So, yeah, let's continue. Okay, so mission number one is complete. We managed to infiltrate the kernel, we got a crash. But that's not enough, right? We want to get to our goal, to meet Lady Cat, and we need to mo keep on moving. What we need to do next is to access Elsa's memory from the, me from the kernel itself. Uh, for that, we need to transfer control to our shellcode. Remember, earlier, uh, Gil showed you a vulnerability that managed, a, a technique actually, that managed to copy a user mode code into kernel mode. He also showed you how to patch case a patch DP, which means that it's now executable. All we need to do right now is to make sure that somehow something will jump into our shellcode and start kicking everything and start the, the execution. In order to do that, uh, the one-day vulnerability was coded in a way that once it's run code inside the kernel, it's going to patch some callback pointers. Uh, and at some point, from user mode, you can call a function that in turn call a function that call a system call that eventually float inside that callback and calls our shellcode. And I want to, uh, Gil, do you mind talking about the shellcode and how it's constructed? Sure. So first thing usually that uh, we want to do in a shellcode is to lock it into the kernel. Entos kernel is where all the code of the Windows kernel lies, okay? So if we find it, we can, just like any other uh, kernel developer, use the APIs which are exported by this model. So once we find it, which is pre pretty simple, a single uh, um, processor instruction, uh, we need to now use to find the APIs themselves, the, the ones we would like to use in the next steps. So. We, we bring with us a simple code of get proc address, which helps us to do it. Once we do it, we are left with just locating Elsas itself. But every time you boot your computer, uh, there is a new ID for this Elsas process. So we need to scan all the processes in the system in order to locate the right one. So there are many techniques to do it, but they are not as robust as uh, we would like to, to have. And um, this is KernelCat. KernelCat is super stealth, and he wants to do it like a pro, okay? And stable. And, and, stable. and stable, right. So what we do is simply reading the PID of Elsas from the registry, okay? It's somewhere just uh, somewhere in the registry, and this is pretty like uh, something special. Not all the processes have it uh, stored in the registry. And once we do that, we attach to the Elsas process, okay? Attaching from kernel is uh, meaning that we change the virtual address space of the user space to be that of Elsas, okay? And once it's there, we can access it from kernel mode, okay. from our shellcode. So we have the shellcode, now we want to, we know that we got access to the kernel, we got the crash, let's improve it and let's start uh, implementing uh, our shellcode. Jump into our shellcode and scan the memory and we'll show you that uh, by running a quick demo uh, that what we're going to see right here, if you execute the demo, you will see that we managed to uh, uh, dump all the modules from within the kernel. Uh, the models in kernel space that Elsa maps. No, you, user mode this time. This user mode, from, sorry. From kernel, but this is the user mode. Right. The user mode, if you'll go downstairs. Yeah, so now you can see the dump of the actual uh, bytes of the Elsa's module 
itself in the memory. So we actually have access to it, and this is only a proof to show you that now we could continue with our uh, goal of reading the memory. So actually, before that, uh, Gil showed you that we cannot dump the memory, we cannot access it, we cannot use Mimikatz, but coming from the kernel side, different game. OK, great. So we managed to access the memory. One last mission is left, is we want to extract the hashes from memory. And that's actually the pretty easy step. There's also a lot of research done by uh, researchers such as the Mimikatz guy. And what he showed, basically, is that credentials are stored in memory in a reversible way in Elsa's address space which means that now we have access to the hashes. We also have access to the keys that relies on the same memory space. All we need to do is scan the memory linearly, and we have access to the memory, as you saw, looking for a specific set of signature based on the operation system uh, version, and then just dump those keys, dump those hashes, decrypt using uh, the algorithm that was used, whether it be triple DES or AES, and just show the password. Let's finish the exploit, show the quick demo, Last one, what we're going to see right now is scanning the memory, looking for the signatures, and let's see if we manage to do it. Great. Yep. Nice. <laughs> okay. So, so, yay. We managed to get the hashes. The attackers managed to get in. Way to go. And, of course, goal is achieved. Colonel Cat is happy, as you can see. Let's summarize what we've seen today. Windows 8.1 security improved uh, immediately. Um, they added a lot of security mitigations, such as the protected processes, such as the hardening on data structures. We've seen a lot, and we heard in the news in the last couple of weeks about a lot of attacks that are targeting uh, memory, like non-persistent malware. Malware that only resides in memory, which means that when the process is done, everything is wiped away. Focus on live memory forensics. This is like the big thing, the next big thing. Everyone talking about it, no one is doing it yet, at least good. So focus on that. Pass there, whatever is still here to stay, as long as single sign-on is still here. We need to understand that we're doing a lot of uh, substantial uh, efforts to make sure that no one will get into those hashes. And while you think that kernel access is over, things are going to change drastically in Windows 10, where we'll introduce a lot of new technologies, such as vContainers, that makes getting those hashes extremely hard and sometimes impossible. Upgrade now. And most importantly, cats, cats are awesome. awesome. I would like to thank you, Gil. Thank you. Thank you very much. much.